I'd like to ask that you pray that the Lord would help me to keep this old flesh out of the way. I want us to hear from God tonight. I'm thankful to know Christ as Savior and Lord. You see, Christ is not Savior where He's not Lord. The Lordship of Christ is not just for the strong Christian. But it's for all Christians. And I'm thankful that He's my Savior and Lord. We'll be in Romans chapter 8 tonight. Romans chapter 8, if you'll turn with me there. We'll hear the Spirit-led words of the Apostle Paul, the great spokesman of the grace of God. By no means is Paul the only spokesman of the grace of God in the New Testament. But he is a spokesman for the grace of God. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse number 31. And I want to read on down to the end of the chapter as the Lord would lead. Romans chapter 8, verse number 31. Here the Word of God says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. More than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, we ask your blessings now in the reading of your holy word. And I pray God that you would speak to our hearts tonight. We need you, God. We need to hear from God. And we love you and we love your church. And we thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we ask these blessings. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. I especially want to draw our attention to verse number 32. Verse number 32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Now, I don't know how this passage of Scripture strikes you, but I'm just going to share it as the Lord spoke it to me. I was sitting at my desk the other day, and I was just praying, and I was praying, and I was beseeching the Lord, and I was seeking God's face, and I was asking God, God, just help me to love people as you would have me to love them. And Lord, I was just, I was just saying, Lord, uh, just, just make the words that are spoken from this pulpit effective. You know, it takes Him to make the preaching effective. The Bible said that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. There's power in the preaching of the cross, but it takes God to make that preaching effective. I hope we all know that. The Bible is His Word, and the Bible is effective, but God would not have His preachers to try to get up in a cold, dead spirit. God doesn't want a preacher to get up in some unregenerate spirit. God makes the preaching effective, and He is certainly able, but my prayer is that God would move in such a way that the preaching here at this church from behind this pulpit would be the kind of preaching that reaches the heart and not just the head. And then I read this verse of Scripture. In verse number 32 of Romans chapter 8, and my mind just went back to Calvary. My mind began to sit center on Calvary where there the precious Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, He hung and He bled and He died there and the blood ran down. You know, I've never been to Calvary physically.
physically, but thank God I didn't have to go there. He went in my place. He went in my place. He is the substitute. He is the sacrifice that was offered. And that sacrifice is perfect. It is whole. That sacrifice is complete. It is a sacrifice that lacks absolutely nothing. Why? Because He is the perfect and sinless sacrifice. He is the perfect and sinless Son of God. And there is none other. And as I thought about Calvary and I thought about the precious Lamb of God hanging on the old rugged cross for my sins and your sins and I remembered that young man that I used to be. I remembered that hard-hearted sinner that I used to be. The young man that I once was. Jesus was not precious to him. I was too busy living for myself. I was too concerned in creating a self-image. I wanted nothing to do with Jesus. I wanted nothing to do with God the Father. I wanted nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. Because I was afraid. I was afraid of having my life changed. I didn't want to bow to His control. I wanted to be in control for myself. I wanted to be the master of my own destiny. I wanted to guide my own vessel. I didn't want Jesus anywhere near the will of my life. I wanted to be securely in the driver's seat of my life. I didn't want to love God. I didn't want to have anything to do with a church. I didn't want to give up myself even though I knew down deep in my soul that everything that I had in life, every good gift had come from Him. I already knew that. Even the job that I had came from His loving hand of blessing. But the problem is... I was blind. I was spiritually blind. I was dead in trespasses and sins. These are the marks of one who's spiritually dead. I'd get up each day and I'd go to work and I'd bring home my paycheck at the end of the week and think that I was doing just fine on my own. But I'd have to tell myself not to slow down because I've ever really slowed down and I ever really stopped to think about it long enough. I knew that there was a holy and a righteous God that I was going to stand before one day and give an account of my life. Yes. I knew that. You know, the Bible says that we're all going to give an account to Him that's ready to judge the quick and the dead. But I didn't like that thought. All I wanted to do was take that thought and banish it from my mind. All I wanted to do was take that thought of standing before God and push that far from me. I don't want to think about that, God. I don't want to deal with that today, God. I'll think about that some other time. I'll deal with that some other time. I'll worry about that later. I don't want to think about it right now. And then I would continue to press on in my own limited, minuscule, worthless power. I didn't know at the time, but even then, it was God's preserving grace that was keeping me going. Even then. But it amazes me to know that even when I was a self-centered, self-reliant, blind, lost, spiritually dead, unregenerate sinner, that God so loved me that He had already made a way for me to be saved. He had already opened the door for me to be washed in the precious blood of the Lamb. He had already made a way, even then, for me to be saved by His marvelous grace. And I'd like to say to the young man or the young woman out there who may be running from God tonight, you'll never be able to outrun Him who's everywhere <laughs> present. That's right. Amen. Never. To the young man or the young woman out there who thinks that you can just push God off forever and avoid Him, it won't happen because when you come down to the end of your life and you're tired and you're weak, God's still the same. He ain't never been tired and weak and He's not about to start now. Yeah. So you're going to have to face Him. And the best thing you could do is face Him now before you squander another day of His grace in this life. So here in verse number 32... I see the cross. I see the most precious gift that's ever been given affixed to the old rugged cross of Calvary and it's Jesus. It's Jesus and He's hanging there on the cross in agony and pain. And the truly amazing thing is it's not the nails that are holding Him there. They tell us that Russia is having a much harder time taking over Ukraine than what they expected. They tell us that Mr. Putin has underestimated the Ukrainians and, the, and their desire to fight. May I say to you tonight, my dear friend, please never, 
Never, never, never underestimate the power of the saving love of Almighty God. Amen. Never underestimate His power. Amen. There's not a nail that's ever been created that can hold Jesus on that cross. But He stayed on the cross. Not because of any nail, but out of His great love for the lost, ruined sinners like you and I. Then I got to thinking about my present circumstances. And I got to thinking about all of my present needs. And I said, Lord, I need peace for my family. I know you're the Prince of Peace, God. I need peace for my family. Lord, I need sustenance each day. Have you been there recently? Yeah. Lord, I need sustenance each day of my life. I need to be able to go back and forth, God. I need to be able to tend to my business as a, as a husband and as a father and as a pastor. And then he directs me to a promise in his word that says, I am the Prince of Peace. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I'll supply all of your needs according to my riches in glory. And I'm reminded that whatever I stand in need of, that's just what he is. Amen. That's just what he is tonight, church. And I'm reminded that all I'll ever need he supplies that each and every day of my life. And He'll do that for you as well. He's no respecter of persons. So maybe somebody here tonight is bereaved. Maybe you've got a loved one. Or maybe somebody watching online. Maybe you've got a loved one who has recently passed away. Even in your time of bereavement, I want you to know that God is still love. Amen? Yes. God is still love. He has stopped being love. God is still love today. As long as He's God, and He always will be God, you'll never have to go through a single moment of sorrow inside of your life as a person who has no hope. Aren't you glad for hope tonight? Mm -hmm. But you see, that's only for the saved. Those who have rejected Christ, they don't have this hope. But you can have it if you'll come to Jesus. You can have it if you'll repent believe the Gospel. You, you can have it if you'll turn to Christ in faith and repentance and the hope that we have can be yours and He'll delight to give it to you. But you've got to come to Him on His terms. Not your terms, but on His terms. So maybe you're going through the greatest trial of your life right now and as you sit here in the very house of God, maybe, just maybe, I don't know your heart, but maybe somebody here, you don't know what you're going to do next. You don't know what step to take next. I'd like to say to you that God is still love. Amen? God is still love. He's got a perfect plan for your life. But you see, you've got to trust Him. He's the one you've got to put your trust in. He's the one who said, My ways are higher than your ways. He's the one whose thoughts are past finding out. You've got to trust the one who knows the end from the beginning. In God's plan, it's not always sunshine and rainbows. You see, but there's some suffering involved in this Christian life. But we don't want to hear about suffering but it's true, there's some suffering, there's some affliction that you're going to have to face along the way. The Apostle Paul, he knew a little bit about suffering. He knew a little bit about affliction. He knew a little bit about persecution. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 8, he said, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done that I may win Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So part of the suffering that the Apostle Paul went through in his life was to be exposed to dangers. That was a part of his suffering. There were dangers that came as a result of Paul living for God. You know, there are dangers out there, my dear friend. Why? Because there's a real devil. And he is your adversary. He walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is that thief that cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and destroy. And none of that has changed. He is still there. Amen. We know that God is in control, uh, but He's still there. You've got a real adversary. And all we need to know to see this is to look at Paul's life. But when we do that, we also see that God is in control, and we also see that there is a God who gives the final victory. Why? Because He's still loved. 
Amen? God is still love. God was love in my own life. When I came to Him almost 21 years ago, and He's still love as I stand here behind this pulpit right now. He's not stopped being love, and He'll still be love tomorrow morning when you get up out of bed, and He'll still be love next year if God lets the world stand. He'll never stop being love. Why does that matter? It matters a great deal because when my wife almost died in the hospital, I was able to face the day knowing that there was a loving God who's still there. Amen. It matters because when my father passed away over 10 years ago, I could walk on knowing that thanks be unto God, there is a glad reunion day that's coming one day after a while. Amen. It matters because there's still peace and comfort that comes from knowing that He's still loved. And His love is stronger than any nuclear weapon, any chemical weapon, any biological weapon. His love is stronger than the attack of the strongest enemy. God's love is even stronger still. And that means something to me. So please consider this, friends. If God had enough love to give you the Lord Jesus Christ, enough strong love, enough deep love, to take His only begotten Son from His very own bosom and transfix Him to yonder cross to be accursed for your sins and mine. He certainly has enough love to incline His ears to the cries of His people. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to Psalm 17. I said, if God has enough love to give you His only begotten Son and transfix Him to the old rugged cross, He certainly has enough love to incline His ears to your Christ, child of God. Psalm 17 and verse number 6. I have called upon Thee, for Thou wilt hear me, O God, Incline thine ear unto me and hear my speech. Do you know what it means to incline the ear? Specifically for God to incline His ear. It means that God bends down. God bows down. God extends and outstretches His ear to the cries of His children. That's what it means for God to incline His ears to the cries of His children. When God inclines His ears to the prayers of His children, that means that as His children, we have the full assurance that He's going to hear our prayers. Now, not everybody can say that. Not everybody in this world can say that I've got the full assurance that God's going to hear my prayers. Because not everyone's His child. And some of you mothers know exactly what it's like to be in a place, whether it's a busy park or a playground or some place where there's a lot of kids running around. And yet when your child cries out, you know their voice. Above all of the other voices, you know the voice of your child. You can tell the voice of your child from all of the other voices and you know that's your child and you incline your ear and you take action. Right? Now how much better is it when the thrice holy righteous God of all creation takes action on behalf of His children? How much better is that? He'll incline His ear to your cries. He loves you that much. When your heart is full of sorrow, God will incline His ears to your cries. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 22, it says, The blessing of the Lord it maketh rich, and He addeth no sorrow to it. That's an application to the life of the believer. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is spiritual richness. There is wisdom. There is fulfilled desire. This is what you have as a believer. You've got a solid foundation as a believer. You've got joy. You've got a stronghold. You've got roots that go down deep to keep you in place. But by contrast, the life of the unbeliever 
is marked by unrighteousness, spiritual poverty, ignorance, dissatisfaction, shifting sand, and weakness. And spiritual deadness. Aren't you glad that we have a Savior who rescues us from sorrow? Yes, amen. He delivers us from trouble. Sure, you'll go through problems in this life. Sure, you'll have heartaches in this life. But He walks with us every step of the way. Praise His holy name. His deliverance will come, child of God. His deliverance will come. Either in this life, or in the hereafter, or in both. It will come for the child of God. He delivers us from temptation. I'm thankful for that. He provides our needs. He comforts us in the time of our grief. Never, 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 never doubt that God is able to do all of these things for His people. How do we know all of this? We know it because of the cross. We know it because of the cross where the Savior came and died for our sins. Melissa, if you'll come to the piano. You see, friends, that cross where the Lord Jesus Christ hung and bled and died, that cross is a standing pledge to all of us who are saved by grace. It's a pledge until the troubles of this life are gone forever. That he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, that he will with him also freely give us all things. That's all things that are necessary for your good and all things that will promote his eternal glory. So that's the kind of God He is. And I sure am thankful. And I sure am glad that I know Him today. Do you know Him? Do you know Him, my dear friend? If not, you can come to know Him. If He's drawing you, you can be saved. You can be saved.